Good morning, everybody. Good to have you at Liberty Church online. If you've been joining us for a couple of weeks, we're glad you're here. We love you already. To all those families that have joined Liberty Church since lockdown, you haven't even been to one of our physical locations, we love you already. To all our family in Kent, England, in Maidstone, to Pastor Craig and Stacy and Chris and Larisha and the fantastic team, uh, Jim and Karen and everyone there. We love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We are thrilled with what God is doing in England. And to John and Andrea in Romania, fantastic to have you. To Paul and Kathy and the family in Nairobi and uh, Pastor Stephen and to all those who are watching from all over the place, from those watching in the United States, those watching from Abu Dhabi, for those watching around the world, we thrill that you're with us. And we want you to stay tuned. So, so get on a WhatsApp group. Invite someone to watch this experience right here, right now. Just tell them, come on, wake up. Come on, let's talk about it. Let's talk about um, what's going on. Let's talk about the, the worship. Let's talk about the word. Let's talk about preachers picked up weight in lockdown. Hey, how are you coping in lockdown? Welcome to our new series, our new series called um, Mental Lockdown, When Life in Lockdown Becomes Too Much. Hey, we're all getting sick and tired of this already, but I've got good news for you. And I want to start off uh, our series um, with this question. I want to ask you a question. What is the most important organ in your body when it comes to having a healthy and thriving sex life? That's right. So what is the most important? important organ in your body. Yes, you're right. It's the organ between your ears. Your brain, obviously, I know you know that because you're intelligent. You know, your brain is so incredibly powerful. It's not just the most important um, organ with regards to your love life. It's I the most important organ in terms of your life. Your brain is your command center. R it rules through your nervous system, and, 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 it, and it instructs you and directs you in terms of what to say, how to act, and how you relate to your world. Now, your, your brain is a physical organ. And the most influential and directive uh, part of you is not your brain, it is your mind. Your mind is your non-physical uh, heart, thought, faculties to make decisions, to ascertain and uh, get perspective on your feelings and to uh, direct your thoughts. The Bible speaks about your soul, which is your mind, your emotions, your will. It's your ability to think, to feel, and to choose. It's that part of you that is non-physical, but your conscious mind, which operates when you're awake, and you're not always conscious when you're awake. Some of you I know need a cup of coffee before you're conscious, even though you're awake. But your conscious mind, which is 10% of your mind, operates when you're awake. It assimilates all the information coming into you from your world, and you make thoughts feelings, and choices that instruct your brain. Now, your conscious mind is also informed by your past. It's formed by your non-conscious mind, which is 90% of your mind. It's that part of you that never stops thinking, feeling, choosing, working. Your non-conscious mind operates 24-7. That's why you can wake up in the morning and have a brand new thought that you've actually been thinking about while you've been sleeping as your non-conscious mind recalibrates itself, sends a message through your subconscious into your conscious mind, and boom, you wake up with a thought. So the part of you that's going to live forever, your mind, your soul, your spirit, your heart, is so important because your mind matters because it influences the matter in your brain. Your mind is so incredibly powerful that every 10 seconds, your mind assimilates the data, the information of what's happening around you. It takes the incoming information. It takes the upcoming memories and belief systems, what you believe to be true based on your past experiences from your non-conscious mind through your subconscious. And in a millisecond, in a nanosecond, you can accumulate a thought, you can uh, assimilate a feeling to that thought, come up with a decision, and that decision gets passed on through quantum energy and an, an electromagnetic field into your brain where there are proteins and where there are chemicals that form dendrites and axions, and you can construct brand new belief systems and thoughts in your brain. That's how powerful your mind is. That's how powerful your brain is. Here's a picture right now of a dendrite. 
this is an arbor-like structure. It looks like a tree of proteins, chemicals uh, that form a dendrite and an axion. And your brain, let's look at the next picture. Your brain is full of these trees, these forests. Now, the fruit in the forest taking up real estate in your brain comes from the root of what you decided, what you chose, what you felt, and what you thought in your mind. So in your mind, you have the root system of either healthy belief systems, healthy thoughts, healthy memories that go into your, uh, into your brain, or you either have in your brain a forest, a fruit of a toxic root in your in your mind that brings toxic fruit into your brain and the outcome of toxic belief systems, toxic thinking, perpetual anxiety, dread, fear, disappointment, betrayal, guilt, and shame produce forests of um, arbor structures of toxic thoughts and belief systems in your brain that then affect the way you speak to people, the way you act in life, and the way you engage in your world. And so in this series, we want to speak about how you can do brain surgery on your own brain by changing your mind. Let's go to Dr. Caroline Leaf. She says an incredible thing. Uh, she's a communications pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist who has specialized in neuropsychology. Uh, and she says, if your mind is not right, then nothing in your life is going to be right. Incredible. Listen to that again. If your mind is not right, that non-physical, spiritual soul part of you, if your mind is not right, nothing in your life is going to be right. In fact, that's what the Bible says in, in Proverbs 23 and verse 7. It says, as a man or a woman thinks in his or her heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You are not who you think you are. You are not who you think others think you are. You are what you think. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the root system of what you perpetually and continually think about produces fruit in your brain and then engages you or helps you as, your, as you, in your body engage with the world. Look at what Proverbs 4.23 says. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. So in this series, today, I want to ask you to start getting into a routine of guarding your heart. Because you are not who you think you are. You are what you think. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so guard your heart. Why would you guard your heart? Put a sentry over your heart. Why? For from it flow the issues of life. Every issue you're facing right now, and many of us are facing the same issues, but you're processing it, I'm processing it differently because the issues in our life don't come ultimately in terms of its primary impact from the outside of our lives, but the issues, the situations, the relationships, your relationship to your work life, to your family life, to your finances, everything has to do with your heart with your mind. Guard your heart, for out of your heart flow the issues of life. Look at what Philippians 4 verse 8 says. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. What you think about what you allow your mind to gravitate towards influences your brain, and your brain influences what you say, what you do, and how you engage with your world. Now, I've said all of that to point us to our scripture this morning, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Let's go there. Romans chapter 1, 12, verses 1 and verse 2. And to listen to what Paul says, and Paul is speaking here, he's speaking to the Romans, and Paul knows that this scripture is, this letter to the Romans is not just going to go to Rome, it's going to go to all the churches that he's planted. And he says to the Romans in chapter 1, sorry, verse 1, chapter 12, he says, I appeal to you therefore, 
by the mercies of God. So he's saying, I've got something important to say. I'm appealing to you. You know what it's like with your kids or your grandkids when you want to get their attention and you want, to, you, want to, you want to tell them something very important. You say, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Listen to me. Paul's saying the same thing to the church. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God. And he says, therefore, because he's about to say something that links to what he said before. That's why he says, therefore. So whenever you see a therefore, you've got to look what it's there for. So what did he say before he's going to say what he's going to say? And what he's going to say is so important. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. Well, let's go to chapter 11 and verse 36. Let's look at the last verse of what he said and what he's referring to when he says, therefore. He says, for Speaking about God now, Paul says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever and ever. The important thing Paul is saying is that from God, through God, and to God are all things. To Him be glory forever. What is glory? Glory is kavod. It means heavy in value. It means uh, brilliant in intellect and application. It means bright and beautiful beyond comprehension, beyond words. It means power that is untainted by any evil. It means grace that never ends. It means mercy that is new every morning. The glory of God is the beauty, the brilliance, the significance, the splendor, the great love, the great power, the great presence, the great grace, the great mercy of God. And he says to that, that God's glory is going to be forever. Paul is here thinking about the minor prophet of Habakkuk in chapter 2 and verse 14 who says that all of history is moving to one point from, from, from creation to completion, from conception to uh, consummation he says history is moving to one place where the whole earth will be filled not with the glory of God he says the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God God's story History and your story is moving to one place when God wraps everything up. Every person who's ever lived is going to know one thing above everything. They're going to know this, that God deserves all the honor because all the glory belongs to him. All the beauty, the brilliance, the significance, the splendor. He says all of history is moving to one place where the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the beauty, the brilliance, the significance, the splendor, the power, the love, the grace, the mercy, the value of God. And so Paul says, because I said that, because God will receive all the glory, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So why is it a spiritual worship? We're still in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Why is it spiritual worship? You know why it's spiritual worship? He's saying before history gets to that place where everyone will know what they should have always known, that all the glory belongs to God. He says get to that place now and present your body your body represents all that you are. If you are not in your body, if you don't have a body, then you're a nobody. You're not even here. The problem if, with, the, with not looking after your body is that when your body runs out, you run out, and you're going to spend eternity in one or two places, heaven or hell. He says, but while you've got a body, lay down your body as a living sacrifice. Listen to what he says which is your reasonable or acceptable spiritual worship. In other words, don't wait for the end of time till you know that God is glorious. Right now, lay down all that you are on all that He is. Do everything in your life to worship God. The way you do business for the glory of God. The way you treat your spouse for the glory of God. The way you relate to your children for the glory of God. The way you treat your finances and your budget and you spend your money. Do it for the glory of God. Lay down your body as a living sacrifice which is spiritual worship. Because when you lay down all that you are on all that He is, He will receive all the glory and you will be filled with His glory because because he created you in his image with his glory. David says in Psalm 8, What is man that you're mindful of him, that you've made him a little lower than the angels? For you have crowned him with glory. There is a beauty, a brilliance, a significance, a splendor about you that only comes alive when you lay down your life and give all that you are to all that he is so that he will receive all the glory. 
in the way you do business, in the way you do relationships, in the way you do finances, in the way you do life. So how do you give God glory? Well, you and I give God glory by laying down our bodies and giving all that we are to all that He is. But then how do we lay down our bodies? Verse 2 says this. Look at verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Listen, this world will tell you you don't need God. This world will tell you it's not about His glory, it's about your popularity. This world will tell you it's not about God's love, it's about you loving yourself. This world will tell you, God, stuff God, you don't need God. We're in this situation because of God. Man blames God for everything that goes wrong. Man doesn't take responsibility. In fact, Paul says in Romans 3, he says, when you sin, you fall short of the glory of God. Listen, we've got to come back to the glory of God. Do not be conformed. Do not be conned or formed in your thinking by the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the way you and I give glory to God, the way we lay down our bodies as a living sacrifice is by renewing our mind, that we may test and discern what is the will of God, the good, pleasing, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Romans 12 and verse 2. Do you know that God's will for you because He created you. He knows you. He knows what's best for you. Do you know that God's will for you is good for you? Not just spa good for you. God's will is good for you. It's, it's acceptable. When, when, when you know God's will for your life, it's, it resonates with you. It says God's will is perfect for you. I remember walking into a shop once and I tried on a jacket and I put it on and it fitted perfectly. You know it's my favorite jackets. You know God's will for you is a jacket for you. When it's perfect for you. It'll be your favorite thing to do to live for God's glory. You will only come alive when you are not living for yourself, but you're living for God's glory. That's what it means to renew the mind. So how do we renew the mind? How do we go through lockdown, post-lockdown? The world will never be the same again. How do we cope with an uncertain future? How do we get perspective on our past? How, we, how do we um, interpret our present? How do we visualize and innovate and have vision for our future? You see, you and I cannot control what's happening around us, but we can control how we respond to what's happening around us. That when fear and anxiety and dread and disappointment and loss and betrayal come, we can take hold of our mind. And instead of making choices based on feelings and thoughts that are toxic and pervasive, and instead of passing on toxicity into our brains, allowing our brains through neuroplasticity to develop new pathways of healthy thinking instead of the same old toxic patterns that come through us not managing our minds. I want to encourage you to be a person who is committed to renewing your mind uh, every single moment of every single day and aligning your mind with the mind of God, your will with God's will and stepping in to the life that he has for you. John writes to beloved Gaius in 3 John 2 and he says, I pray that you may prosper. Prosper means to excel, to do well, to be healthy, to succeed. He says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. You see, prosperity starts in your thinking, in your soul, in every thought, feeling, and choice being assimilated and aligned with the truth of God and passed on to your brain so that you can live the life that God has for you. So three things in renewing the mind. When you have thoughts of fear or dread or disappointment or betrayal, three things, embrace, reframe, Renew. Say that with me. Embrace, reframe, renew. Come on, let's say it one more time. Write it in the chat uh, box. Embrace, reframe, renew. When a thought comes, you, you see a post on Facebook, you get a call from a friend, you see some bad news, uh, your boss calls you in, um, your significant other packs her bags and walks out. What do you do? You've got to embrace it. 
You've got to reframe it. And you've got to renew your mind. What does embrace mean? Well, you see, so many times when, when thoughts of fear, persistent thoughts of anxiety come our way, we try and deny it. Don't deny it. You can delay it. And sometimes delaying a decision about an anxious thought is not a bad thing because you remove its power. Sometimes you can de delegate it. Sometimes the fear or the anxiety or the dread that comes to you is actually not your responsibility. It's not for you to worry about. So then pass it on to the person who ought to be worrying about it. But one thing you can't do is deny it. You are either got to delay it, you got to delegate it, or you got to deal with it. How do you deal with it? Well, you got to embrace it. Now ask yourself this question, what is the fear? Describe the fear. What is the feelings that, you, that, that are being conjured up right now? Because this is going to help you make a decision. What are the feelings? And one of the ways you can diagnose your feelings is to look at the fear. Or, 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 or evaluate your physical symptoms. Do you have a knot in the stomach? Do you have a knot in your stomach? Do you have a headache? Do you have tension in your shoulders? So embrace it and write it down. And then ask yourself, when you ask yourself, what is the fear? What are the feelings? What are the physical symptoms? Then ask, why? What is the reason? Did I say something that was miscommunicated? Did I betray someone's trust? That person who stole money from the company, um, why did they do that? Why did they betray the organization? Um, or is this a curved ball? Is this just we're in lockdown and this industry is in lockdown and there's nothing we can do about it? So, you see, what you're doing right now by embracing what you're going through is you're engaging yourself in mind management. You're doing what Paul says to renew your mind. Not being conformed to the patterns of the world, but you're changing your mind so you can find God's good, pleasing, and perfect will, His acceptable will in your life. So first you embrace it. Secondly, reframe it. How can you reframe it? How can you reconceptualize what's going on here? And when you're reframing what you're going through, you're asking for the facts. What are the facts? They stole the money. She packed the bags and left me. Uh, he won't talk to me anymore. What are the facts? Now, after the facts, what are the assumptions I'm making? Well, well the assumption is he stole the money because he's evil. He, uh, she left me because she hates me. Um, uh, uh, he betrayed me because um, he doesn't believe what I said to him when we had that argument or whatever it is. So what are your assumptions? And then after you've got the facts, the assumptions, what is the truth? That person may have stolen some money because what you don't know is that their mother is going through a, a chemotherapy and needs money for medication. And instead of coming to, to speak to you about it or going to a bank to get a loan, they stole the money. So what is the truth? You've got to get to the truth. And then the last thing you've got to do in reframing is you've got to ask, what is the worst thing that can happen? What is the worst case scenario? You see, once you face the worst case scenario, you can start reframing and finding solutions. So embrace it, reframe it, and then renew your mind. When we renew our mind, we submit every thought, every feeling, every choice to the truth. What truth? The truth of who God is, the truth of who you are, and the truth of your life. So what's the truth about God in the situation, in the storm, in this complexity? What is the truth? Now, the truth of God is God is love, and His love for you is unconditional. The truth of God is that He's good. And He has always been good to you. And the truth about God is that He's all-powerful. He can change the situation. He can help you change your mind and change your heart as you go through this process. What is the truth about you? The truth about you is that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're a child of God. If you're a child of God, you may have made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. What is the truth about you? What does the Word of God say about you and your identity in Christ? And then what is the truth about life? The truth about life is that God still has a purpose and a destiny for you. That He's come to give you life and life to the full. That He has plans for you to give you a future and a hope. He hasn't got plans of evil. He has good plans for you, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says. So can you see how important it is to embrace, reframe, and renew your mind? Um, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to lay down your body as a living sacrifice. 
as spiritual worship. Now, throw all that you are on all that He is because the whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. So give God glory now by giving all that you are, every relationship, every situation, your work situation, your finances, your emotions, how you feel about life, how you feel about yourself. Throw all of you, all that you are on all that God is. And the way you do that is by renewing your mind, reframing situations, reframing past disappointments and betrayals, losses that you've gone through, and start seeing them from God's perspective and get the truth to shine in on the facts. You see, facts change, but the truth always remains the same. The last thing I want to do this morning is I want to give you three ways you can position yourself to renew your mind. If you position yourself in these three ways, it'll help you renew your mind in any and every situation. I want you to consider your identity, your destiny, and your eternity. You know, when I was 13 years old, I went to boarding school, and I was very homesick um, the first year of boarding school. I missed home terribly. Um, I missed my parents terribly. And um, I'm not going to start crying now, so please don't feel sorry for me. I got through that. I went for counseling. I'm, I made it. Now, actually, I didn't, I didn't even go for counseling. God did an amazing thing in my life. When I was 13 years old, I was asking myself three questions. Who am I? What is my purpose? And what happens when I die? Identity, destiny, eternity. Friend, I want you to realize that when you discover your identity in Christ, when you discover your divine sense of value, it doesn't matter what storm you go through in life. It doesn't matter what people say about you to your face or behind your back. It doesn't matter what you, um, your boss says about you, what your uh, uh, teacher says about you, what your friends say about you. When you are settled in your identity, when you know who you are, that you're a child of God, that you're created in the image of God. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are God's workmanship created in Christ. You're a masterpiece. God created you for His own glory. You know, the evil of racism is that it is a demonic attack on people's identity. Don't ever feel less than you are because of any aspect of who you are. You are a child of God. You're created in the image of God, and your identity is in Christ. Once you know your identity, you can step into your destiny. You can have a divine sense of purpose in life. Ephesians 2.10 says, you are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece created in Christ for good works, which God has prepared that you should walk in them. God's got something good for you to do. You're a child of God, and God has a plan and a purpose for you. You're a child of God, your identity. You have a destiny. And, if, and, and Ecclesiastes 11, 3.11 says, God has made everything beautiful in its time, and He has put eternity into your heart. Even as I speak right now, you know that you are an eternal being. That your soul, your spirit, your mind, your emotions, your will is going to live forever. Not in this body, but in another body. You, that you know that deep is calling to deep right now. That there's something about you that you know you're going to live forever. You're not just going to die and go into, into the ground six foot under, and that's the end of your, your life. You know that's a lie. You know that's not true. So let me speak to your heart right now. Let me speak to your soul right now. Let deep call to deep. You are a child of God. God has a purpose for your life and He's put eternity in your heart. You need to have a divine sense of value, identity. You need to have a divine sense of purpose, your destiny. And you, have to have, you need a divine sense of eternal security. You're going to spend eternity in one of two places. Heaven or hell. With God or without God. But you get to choose. You don't get to choose once this life is over. Now is the only time that you can choose. So I want to encourage you. Embrace the storm you're going through. Reframe what you're going through or even your past. And you know, when you reframe your past, you don't negate what you went through. Reframing your past doesn't negate what you went through, 
But what it does do, it disempowers the message it's sent to you that there's something wrong with you. There's not something wrong with you. Even when people have hurt you and abused you, it's not because there's something wrong with you. It's because there's something wrong with them. You are a child of God, highly favored and loved by the Father. So I want to give you an opportunity today to make the most intelligent decision of your mind that will affect your brain and affect your life. I want to ask you to change the way you think about who God is, about who you are, and about your life. I want to ask you, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today to pray this prayer with me and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. Will you do that with me? Will you gather a thought that will become a confession or a word or a prayer? Because you see, in our heart, we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And with our mouth, we confess that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus opens the door to a relationship with God. And God is moving the entire history to one place that everyone will know that He is God that He deserves all the honor and all the glory, and that Jesus is His Son, and the Holy Spirit is working, speaking, whispering to you right now. Will you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you make a decision that's going to impact your life and your eternity? It's going to impact who you are, what you do, and where you spend eternity. If that is you, right now, just pray this very simple prayer with me. If you have the courage to pray it out loud, pray it out loud. Tell the people around you, this is it. My life's going to count. I have a purpose and a destiny. I have a future and a hope. Otherwise, just pray it in the depth of your heart, in the integrity of your heart, and mean this prayer with all your heart, and ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and your Savior. You ready? Let's go for it. Come on, say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a mess without you. I need you in my life. Right now, I believe that you died on the cross and you took all my shame, all my guilt, all my pain, all my sin, my past, my present, and my future sin. I believe that, Jesus, you were raised from the dead. And the same power that raised you from the dead will one day raise me from the dead to live forever. So, Jesus, here we go. Thank you for being my master, my Lord, and my Savior. I determine by the choices I make right here, right now, to live for you and to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to my life. Thank you for a brand new life. Friend, if you pray that, come on, let's applaud all those that made that decision. Just say, click, I raised my hand or raised hand in the comment box. Just respond to, uh, to the uh, option in, in, on, on the comment box or um, I gave my life to Christ or raised hand. Just click raise hand right now. We're waiting for you. This is the single most important decision in your life. Say, yes, I raised my hand. I raised my hand. I'm for Jesus. I'm going to live for Him. I'm laying down my body as a living sacrifice. I'm changing my mind about who God is, who I am in my life. I'm starting a brand new life in Jesus' name. Come on, click there. Right now, we're waiting for you because we want to send you something. We want to send you some material that's going to help you in your walk with Jesus. We, we want to come alongside you and, and encourage you. We're in your corner. and We want to give you some content. So just click raised hand right there. Just click it right now. Just click that box saying, I gave my life to Jesus. Do it right now. Yes, you can do it tomorrow. You can go on our website and do it. But do it right now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time for you to be beautiful, to be who God called you to be. And we want to send you something. Hey, don't miss out on, on what God is doing. Read your Bible at least four times a week. Start getting the Word of God, the will of God into your thinking. Start making decisions based on feelings and thoughts that are aligned with God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. And I know you're going to go from strength to strength, from beauty to beauty, from glory to glory. So glad you joined us this morning. Join us next week for Pastor Lucas Connell from Australia, who's going to do incredible.
incredible things as he preaches the Word of God and breaks off um, addictions and mindsets and lockdown in our thinking and will set you free. Invite friends next week to listen to Pastor Lucas Connell. It's going to be incredible as we continue our series, Mental Lockdown. When life and lockdown get too much, we love you so much.